Does manual treasury management and operations have your crypto business stuck in the slow lane? Scale up and speed ahead with Fireblocks, the number one platform for crypto operations and trading pros that makes custody, settlement, and rebalancing quick and easy. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all of their crypto assets in one place. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. I'd also like to give a shout out to Cross River. Whether you're a crypto exchange, NFT marketplace, or wallet, Cross River's integrated API based platform provides the payment solutions you need to grow. A CryptoFin industry award winner and an early partner for companies like Coinbase, Cross River's tech stack supports crypto partners and enables real time money movement for consumers. Welcome to a new world of crypto friendly banking at CrossRiver.com slash crypto. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblockcrypto.com slash terms dash service. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block. And I'm very excited for today's episode. We have on the other side of the mic, my dear friend, Evgeny Gavoy, CEO of Wintermute, the trading firm, market-making firm, and let's pepper in a little OTC for good measure. Before founding Wintermute, Evgeny ran the ETF business at HFT firm Optiver. And for the past five years since, he's been leading Winter Mute and has really grown it into, um, I mean, I think we're over, what, 200 people now? A bit, a bit less. Hi, a Frank. little bit less. But you guys are trading like, I mean, one of your biggest months was like, we always talk about this, like almost 100 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just insane. Um, well, I'm super excited to have you on, not just to like, not just for your inaugural episode of the scoop but just to unpack this market right i mean i don't think i mean we've had down cycles we've had big drawdowns but i don't think we've ever had one token completely evaporate within a day or two 50 billion dollars just gone how do you navigate that as a trading firm and did you have any exposure are you down bad uh we didn't have any exposure we were able to position ourselves rather neutral, I would say. But yeah, it's, I guess every trading firm had to do some homework with with the whole Terra Luna situation. And some, I think some trading firms ignore it. Some trading firms did it quite well. Like if you look at, yeah, what Galois was posting, for example, for uh, almost a month before that, with all the like Roman and uh, Carsage needs to be sacked uh, metaphors. But yeah, I think a lot of firms were probably positioned to profit from it and yeah, cannot blame them for that. But uh, yeah, it's quite, quite a few things you need to take and take out obviously. And I think it's, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I guess like one, one really interesting part of it is everyone is trying to find the scapegoat. Everyone tries to find this like big bad guy. And there were like all those silly rumors of Citadel floating yesterday. But people don't understand that, yeah, it's not that straightforward for somebody to do a run like this. So how would you explain the catalyst behind this unraveling? Yeah, I would say to me, actually, the most likely explanation is I don't think anyone necessarily triggered it because, yeah, I'm, I'm usually just looking for like the most likely explanation ever. And for me, the most likely explanation ever is, I don't know, maybe some big holders of UST decided, okay, maybe it's just to risk it with market collapse and let me withdraw some. 
and they started with drawing and the the same the funny thing about Luna is it's very like the way it moves it's it accelerates quite a bit with with the UST issuance, but it accelerates to the upwards, but it, it accelerates other way around as well, and it, I would say it accelerates to the downside much much faster. So it can become this death spiral that we witnessed last last couple of days. You kind of like and correct me if I'm describing this wrong. I feel like when we were in the Bahamas to a degree, you had this on your risk radar. Like you kind of felt like something was percolating. Something was sort of like awry in the state of Denmark, so to speak, as it pertains to Terra. What did you, what do you think you saw that maybe other people were just ignoring? I would say to me, one big catalyst was that once the yeah, Luna Foundation Guard or whatever it's called started acquiring other cryptos, that's when it became actually more risky for them. And that's and basically once you start see Bitcoin price dropping, general market sentiment being rather negative because of all the market events, you start preparing yourself for, yeah, so what will happen if Luna tanks 50% down? together with the rest of the market. And you, if you remember, like it actually didn't go down initially. So there was this first downtick and the whole market went down 10, 20% and Luna was just like standing there. Nothing was, was happening to it. And then next day it tanked. And, but before that we were, okay, how do we position ourselves for it? How do we make sure that if it goes down, we don't go, we don't, first of all, like survive because there are first order effects and first like the most obvious first order effects for us were like we did hold some UST not to farm anchor but just to arbitrage it between all kinds of uh, blockchains all kinds of centralized exchanges we did uh, hold some luna as well and so we needed to make sure okay how do we hedge ourselves how do we make sure that we don't yeah we don't get caught in this death spiral if it happens but that that's only a first order effect second order effect is yeah who will potentially blow up from this thing. And that's much, much more, more difficult to predict. And uh, yeah, however fast it goes, you might have, I don't know, you might have big lenders blowing up, for example. You can have whole train companies blowing up. A lot of stuff can happen. And it can be a pretty significant contagion to, to the whole market, further exacerbated by the fact that they did hold quite a massive Bitcoin position. When will the extent of the contagion become apparent? I think it should be apparent quite soon when it, when it comes to really big players. Like we should see all the big guys, like they will get questions from all kinds of you know, counterparties they're dealing with, okay, what's your exposure, like how much you lost, are you still solvent? And as long as they can answer it normally, it should be fine. But from what we can observe, like we don't see any major casualties at the moment. Mm -hmm. Like, look, I'm sure like a lot of my a lot of people lost a lot of money, but most of the money lost was actually in Luna holders. And Luna holders, okay, it's a bunch of VCs probably lost money, a bunch of mm -hmm. train companies who held it since I don't know, like one of one of the previous rounds lost money. But it's nothing that would kill them. Basically, it just basically lost investment. Yeah. So this isn't something like a Lehman or Bear Stearns meltdown for the space. Um, it is for, I would say it is for small people, like for normal people who, for some reason, decided it's a good idea to hold something that gives them guaranteed 20% yield. For them, it's very much like that. Like we will, and that's where the real drama actually comes in, like, Okay, venture firms losing like a few hundred million dollars. Who cares? Like, okay, it's 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 part of their job, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like you hear all these horror stories about I don't know Reddit forums filled with suicide like descriptions and everything. Yeah, that's that's quite sad. It's and horrific. that's pretty much and that that's very much similar to what was happening with Lehman with when like so many people lost their homes, for example. So, how do you think about this moment relative to maybe? When you were, you know, trading through 2009, which was pretty much Optiver's worst year on record, Wintermute's 
I'm assuming navigating this environment better than maybe Optiver did in, in the crisis, but how does the sentiment feel? Like, is the sentiment similar? I think we, we haven't felt it yet. It's more like I've been, I've been in the space since 2018, 2019, and that was a very similar vibe, I would say. Like, yeah, there was not much happening. Bitcoin was just going sideways down. It was quite, well, quite depressing at times to be there. And it's quite possible we'll enter into a similar kind of environment in the, like way past this year. But we are not there yet. It's still kind of exciting to be in the markets at the moment. Mm. It's still like a lot of opportunities, a lot of, I don't know, interesting things going on, a lot of training opportunities. But I don't know, maybe next month when the, when the summer comes, we will see yeah, a lot less excitement. So have you adjusted any of your like risk parameters around this event? Are you going to maybe not dabble with Algo stablecoins as much? Well, we're not dabbling with them in the first place. <laughs> yeah, like I was, I'm generally skeptical about, I was always generally skeptical about Algo stablecoins, well, not backed by any assets. So like DAI is fine, but yeah, most of the others are not really. Like Luna was not really fine because yeah, there was nothing very much concrete behind it. I would say for us, the, the main challenge now will be primarily on the borrowing side. Like that, that's what we already see. Like there is a quite a bit of a squeeze, like lending firms stopped lending. Have we started to see that right now? Yeah, we, we, we see it already, yeah. Mm. It's, it's, nothing, it's nothing crazy, it's nothing serious, and it's pretty much as expected. Like we see it pretty much on all the, basically on all the major down moves, we see, yeah, all the lenders becoming very conservative because again, they don't know which of the trading firms blew up and which ones didn't. So they want to wait a bit before giving them like massive loans. Yeah. So where do you think we go from here? We're just going to kind of be in a, a similar period of like sideways, you know, price movement and kind of like in between a bear bull market situation. I think we'll, we'll see probably quite a bit of side movement. Yeah, probably every all the majors ticking down. Like I think a lot of L1, L2 narratives will get very much challenged because I think, look, to me, basically coming into this space like in 2020, 2021, I had to make an adjustment because you, I don't know, you look at some, I don't know, decentralized exchange and you understand, okay, it has the same valuation as LEC, for example, or NASDAQ, mm. or even more. And it's just like five guys <laughs> with, with a smart contract, and that's it. And maybe they trade more than NASDAQ on any on some days, but most of the days they don't. And it's it's kind of silly. But if you keep this attitude, you will continue to be short all the tokens in the bull market, and that doesn't really work. So you need to make an adjustment. And so... Well, I made an adjustment, pretty much everyone in the industry made this adjustment. And now everyone needs to make an adjustment back. And now everyone needs to say, okay, yeah, those five guys with a smart contract, maybe it does make sense that their like, valuation is, I don't know, $10 billion or $5 billion, or so even $100 million, because it's not really built yet. They have, I don't know, $1 million volume on a daily basis. It just does make sense. And so I think everyone will make those adjustments now. Slowly but steadily, uh, which will obviously cause all the prices to adjust quite a bit, and it will continue. And then at some point, it will get exciting again, and we'll need to make another adjustment back. <laughs> I think that people are like kind of angry too. I was listening to a Twitter Spaces yesterday with a bunch of different um, high-profile like crypto Twitter people, so like Cred and I think Gainsey and some others, and there was just this sentiment of like anti crypto VC and that they've been, you know, selling us a, a bag of lies. So, to, you know, basically about how, you know, Luna stable, Luna's going to the moon. The decoupling narrative is real. All these like bull narratives. What at the same time, like behind the scenes, they're shorting, they're selling. And, like, I, I don't know. I feel like coming out of this, there's there's going to be maybe 
a newfound skepticism over what some of the most prominent like thought leaders are thinking about and and maybe a bit more skepticism over the degree to which they shill their bags but also people have short memories so maybe not once <laughs> the music starts playing again they'll eat it up yeah that's the same like, <laughs> i think it's very silly when people are angry because i don't know oh bad vc is like forced us to buy something because it's it's again like there was a meta there was a certain matter to this game in 2020, 2021, where, well, numbers go up. And you kind of need to adopt this matter. You need to play the game. And, well, as long as you play it, yeah, you, you'll make a lot of money. And everyone kind of understands it. I either very much understands how it works or subconsciously understand how it works. Like, if you're angry now, that means that, okay, you are now realizing, okay, I was actually doing something. I didn't really understand why I was doing it. Maybe like this, but to be honest, like a lot of a lot of those VCs that people are pissed off with, a lot of them never sell, never sold. Like, I'm fairly sure a lot of VCs haven't have never sold, and I think it's more about maybe trading companies that are doing venture investments like us, who can be more opportunistic in those things. And I'm well, I'm not saying that we we are opportunistic, but I'm pretty sure like a lot of them are. But yeah, I think it's in general, yeah, you will see people shilling things and yeah, you can be part of this game or you or you can use your own brain. And I think people are just pissed off that they didn't use their brain in the end. And the same with Luna as well, right? It's like all those people are trying to find like, oh, is it Citadel or BlackRock uh, screwed us? But ultimately it's their fault because yeah, look, you have protocols that gives you 20% yield based on nothing. Well, based on actually VCs that gave them a lot of money and now they're just spending it. So, yeah, I think ultimately you have yourself to blame. And I'm not sure about short memory, actually. I think the memory will... I, I kind of have this experience back from my childhood because I was in... Um, like, I was, I was in Russia in the 90s. I was like, well, not even a teenager back then. And, but I remember it was a very volatile time. It was very much like crypto, I would say, with the only exception that people also occasionally got killed. So that was a bit worse. Uh, but the ethos was the same. It was like free for all. You could you could make like a lot of money if you wanted to do st stuff. And there were, there were a lot of Ponzi's naturally. And like one of those Ponzi's was very famous. It promised people, I don't know, 3,000% yield, for example. And at some point, government stepped in, it killed it, and people were nat naturally angry at first because, yeah, they had this Ponzi, they were making money, and suddenly government just, like, sent all their shares to zero. But afterwards, people, like, it almost, like, this Ponzonomics, it became synonymous with stuff that you should not believe at. And, like, for some generations, I think, well, for my generation at work, like I'm, I was like, okay, I know what the Ponzi is. I literally saw it on TV <laughs> when I was a child. But for my younger brother, he didn't, he doesn't remember it. And same, same with crypto. Like, okay, people, like in two, three years' time, they when they see the next Luna, they will say, okay, that actually looks like Luna. Let's maybe not do that again. <laughs> mm. And but there will be a new generation of people who actually never saw Luna, and then they will get burned. So and it will continue going like this. Yeah, I remember when someone in high school tried to get me involved in one of those money market schemes. I forget what it was called, but it was like this energy drink. And he was like, if you, you know, I remember he had like a piece of paper and like it was like a tree graph. He was like, you know, you'll be at the top and then two people will be below you and then they'll get two other people. I think he wanted yep. like $2,000. And um, yeah, you're right. I, I, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget thinking like, oh, do I do it? And then going home and talking to my parents about it. And they're like, are you fucking stupid? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely don't. But yeah, stuff like that does stick with you. Although I feel like crypto history repeats and rhymes. Even the last um, cycle, one of the big just key events was the unwinding of basis and so that was um, an algorithmic stablecoin. Now we have the unwinding of of Terra, so it doesn't it doesn't look too different. 
Yeah, I guess we start with the start of what was confusing is just so many, like, indeed, so many big firms were behind it. And like, you look at the last round of funding, they have like all the people that you, well, potentially can even respect, right? And then, so a lot of us were like, okay, what, I don't know, I was like, what do we miss in this? Like, do we do we actually miss something? Like this 20% thing doesn't make sense, but okay, maybe, yes, maybe they just like bind the, buying the customers of the whatever the whole protocol and they will continue subsidizing it at some point that will might become self-sufficient yeah why not maybe it will work but i don't know it's it it was a much much better ponzi this time that's that's for sure like quite well done but also like the way it dissolved was very very spectacular yeah so i guess you know, with with all this said, like moving on maybe from Luna specifically, but we're in this uncertain environment. You guys over the past, you know, maybe year or two have been ramping up on the on the venture side. Is that has the venture landscape slowed down to the same halt as the liquid token side? Um to a big degree, yeah. Like and a big difference to like let's say 2018, 2019 is it actually happens in global macro as well. So you in general see, well, you basically don't see that many rounds for gross companies in the first place. And the very last few that happened over the last couple of months, those are like the very, very lucky ones, I would say. And yeah, valuations will drop significantly because yeah, everyone has adjusted already on the traditional side now we'll need to adjust on the crypto side as well i can tell you like they're probably not gonna look into any seed deals valued at above 50 million <laughs> because yeah like it doesn't make sense anymore mm-hmm. yeah so are the valuations like where are the valuations now is it relative to maybe six months ago on the venture side how much have they come down there was no adjustment yet Okay. Say. Yeah. But maybe people are taking longer. Like I remember six months ago, there was like, you don't even talk to the founders. You just sign the check. And if, if you're not, you know, if you're not, and then the turnarounds like a day, I mean, some of these deals get done in a day, which is insane. Yeah. That's over. No, kind of, kind of, I'm, I'm just feel much more comfortable. Like six months ago, I wouldn't, it would, yeah, it would suck because you need to make a decision in a day. You were like, okay, all those big names are investing into those guys and there'll be a token, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Idea seems fine. Yeah, probably we need to do it as well. And now I'm like, okay, I don't like an idea. I don't like evaluation. Like, who are those guys in the first place? We can just say no. That's <laughs> fine. Yeah, there's more comfortability in, in being a bit more conservative than you were before. Having trouble keeping pace with the crypto boom? When your business is scaling up and your portfolio is growing, you don't want to waste precious time on manual treasury management or settling and rebalancing. Fireblocks can handle that for you with smart, scalable solutions for your crypto business, along with industry-leading security and expertise. They'll take care of the back end so you can focus on the big picture. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all their crypto assets in one place. Coinbase Prime fully integrates crypto trading and custody on a single platform and gives clients the best all-in pricing in their network using their proprietary smart order router and algorithmic execution. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have already used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Build a unified investment portfolio with one of the most trusted names in crypto. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. 
This episode is brought to you by Cross River. Building the next big thing in crypto? Then it's time to get your fiat on and off ramp solution from Cross River. Whether you're a crypto exchange, NFT marketplace, or wallet, Cross River's integrated API based platform provides the payment solutions you need to grow. Cross River is powering the future of financial services. A crypto fin industry award winner and an early partner for companies like Coinbase, Cross River's tech stack supports crypto partners and enables real-time money movement for consumers. Welcome to a new world of crypto-friendly banking. Request your fiat on and off-ramp solution now at crossriver.com slash crypto. What about like new, any new types of like projects that you guys are working on? Uh, well, we were working on like quite a few actually, but yeah, now that's now it's an interesting time to launch a protocol, right? Yeah. Uh, good, good news for us is yeah, since we were looking to incubate a few, like we are not in a hurry to do like funding rounds, and honestly, like I don't, I never understood why people in crypto were launching. I don't know, 10, 20, 50 million seed rounds at ridiculous relations. Like you just spoil the team, basically giving them a lot of money. But for us, it's, yeah, it's, it's basically probably, probably we'll just incubate it for a bit longer, uh, a lot of them. But yeah, we have, we have a few ideas. Like actually, <laughs> like just, just like two weeks ago, I had uh, an idea to do our own like algorithmic stable coin. Not, not necessarily algorithmic, but yeah, definitely stable coin. But yeah, we might still do it. Like, just just need to iron out those regulatory details. Yeah, because it's I like because ultimately a lot of primitives that were built in this in this cycle are quite interesting. Like the the idea about um, like rebasing, for example, like how Ample works or how uh, Stake This works, that it just keeps accruing interest, sort of, or or either keeps accruing interest or keeps like giving you more or less tokens based on what you hold. That's pretty cool. The idea in general is that you can see how many tokens are there in circulation. It's also really cool. And so in general, you can build your own stable coin just like that. You don't even need Anchor to pay interest because you can incorporate in, uh, interest as part of the well, rebasing, for example, on a daily basis. And yeah, you can do really interesting things for it because what, what was really wrong about Luna is that 20% yield, which mm -hmm. was coming out of nowhere, it was kind of okay. It was, it was backed by future growth of the protocol, mm -hmm. which could have happened, and but it didn't happen. <laughs> but let's say you have a let's say you have a blockchain protocol that actually has cash flows, and then like they can easily raise money by issuing their own stable coin, and let, let's say they have cash flows of uh, I don't know half a million per year, mm -hmm. so they can issue. I don't know, 5 million worth of stable coins with 10% uh, yield. And then suddenly they have $5 million and they can pay this yield because they actually generate this income. So they can offset this interest uh, payments with what they generate from, from their own protocol. And that model can work. And that model, I think, is really interesting to explore for a lot of protocols. Do you think that like every trading firm might have their own stable coin? Uh, I think it's much more regulatory questions than like a question of te technological question. I think to me, really interesting part about it is it kind of draws, draws parallels with this like private banking back in whatever 19th century in US where all this, uh, what was the name? Wildcat banking, mm -hmm. which which like obviously has a lot of negative connotations, but like there were actually a lot of banks that were doing well, that were actually decent banks. They were just like accepting deposits, issuing their own currency, and they were pretty much solvent and doing the right thing because they were issuing currency where in the places where well, currency was sparse, for example, mm -hmm. because I don't know, central government couldn't print stuff yet. I don't know. Like I might be, I might be saying some bullshit on the historical side every now and then, but I think overall, directionally, it's, it's correct. directionally, it's yeah. right. Yeah, directionally, it should be right. We're going to so, have some wildcat banking expert listen to the show and like literally just <laughs> roast us on Twitter. <laughs> but in general, there's this idea that yeah, companies can issue their own version of dollars. I think it's really interesting. But yeah, obviously we, we can have, yep. if, uh, if Janet Yellen is not going to like it, yeah, we might 
have trouble with that. And but then again, I don't know, maybe we can make our own version of Swiss franc or mm-hmm. I don't know, Zimbabwe and something, or maybe not Zimbabwe. Yeah. But basically, a place where regulators don't really care, for example. Yeah. I don't know. So, what does this mean for DeFi trust? Right? This isn't just a question of like stable coins, algorithmic stable coins are a really important component of, of DeFi. What does this mean for just like trusting? protocols is it going to put into question every time i park money into something 20 percent yield is fairly significant but even like you know six eight you know ten is there going to be a bit more caution to wade into some of these protocols not just from a trading firm perspective um, but from an individual perspective yeah i think Definitely, like, there should be some kind of flight to quality, first of all. Like, people will not farm. Like, the challenge was, again, with the cycle was, yeah, you could easily farm stuff because number goes up. So, like, you buy a token, then you deposit it into some, like, pool, and you get interest in the same token. You don't even need to sell it initially because everything goes up. Everyone is happy. And at some point, it all crumbles, and you move to the next thing. Um it's not going to work in a bear market because yeah, none of those tokens will go up. They will just go down right away. So I think we'll see those yields, first of all, being cut significantly. Second of all, they will make se- like it will make sense where those yields are coming from. And I think maybe we'll see more like sustainable models out there. Yeah. What are you seeing in in the derivatives market? What's the fallout in there? The challenge with the derivatives market, and to be honest, like with any trading applications, is like already in a lot of blockchains, on a lot of L1s, there was an issue where like the only people trading on those DEXs were people who were working, like developing on this particular L1. So you wouldn't see that much retail because, yeah, retail, like it would be a very tough for retail to figure out how to, I don't know, move money to Solana, for example, mm-hmm. or to Avalanche. Like, it's just like, it's really tough for a normal person. And now you will see even less of those people, while at the same time, yeah, people won't necessarily be, I don't know, interested in trading in the first place, even in, like, among developers. And But the challenge with derivative space and any deck space really is you want to iterate, you want to get market feedback. So you, I don't know, you create a new I don't know, option, binary option protocol, for example. And you want to see, like, okay, do people like it? Do people not like it? But nobody will trade there. And so you will get no feedback. Mm-hmm. So you will need to continue creating stuff, hoping that, like, when people will appear, they will actually love it without any feedback loop. And that's that's very challenging. Yeah, because you have no, you have no idea if a sizable portion of the ecosystem will care to use it. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you'll have 50 users who love it, but maybe those users are like all the people in the world that are loving that particular functionality. And like rest other like 1 billion people in the world, they don't really care about buying their options, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, you know, there are so many, I mean, so many products that flop like that. I think NASDAQ launched Water Futures and like, it's like, no volume that was kind of like backed with with their options and futures just like completely just complete flop heart goes out to them well i mean nas nasdaq can afford it but yeah the problem is yeah if you're working on a dex and you keep up coming up with functionalities that nobody wants you just like wasting your burn yeah and at some point yeah and at some point the music stops yep isn't it pretty crazy how like you know, you've been traveling almost as much, I mean, more probably, because you're going to permissionless um, in a few days. Yep. Isn't it crazy, like, the juxtaposition between the exuberance at these events and where we are in the market now? It feels like the sentiment shifted very quickly from beneath our feet. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to how the wipe at permission list and then consensus will feel. Because like I remember my first my first consensus was in 2019 and it was it was quite grounded. Mm. Like 
there was nothing crazy around it. It was like yeah, a round building. And I remember actually yeah, pitching our uh, like <laughs> pitching our uh, institutional seed round during consensus. That was fun. Yeah, I think it will be much more grounded. So mm-hmm. yeah, interested how it will go. Like yeah, no crazy parties probably. <laughs> probably less of the crazy parties. Yeah. What does it look like inside the firm during these like crazy market swings? Like what did yesterday look like for you? Uh, just laser focused, really. Like, as a trader, yeah, you live for those days. Like, you have them, like in traditional finance, you have them, I don't know, maybe once a year, maybe once every two years, even. In crypto, you have them a bit more often, but still, like, yeah, you live for those days. You, so everyone was laser focused, everyone worked even more crazy hours. And I think we had, we had quite a bit of fun as well, like, despite all the, market was it a big down, mo- like was yesterday a big money making day yeah yeah i mean like if you if you have market make and you don't make money in those kind of days yeah you're doing something <laughs> well relatively like maybe like like is it a 2x order of magnitude 5x 10x i would say it's yeah 5 to 10x usually yeah so what are you looking for like what are you trying to are you offloading risk are you you know reaching out to counterparties like what is it like at a granular level look like for people yeah so for me is a like for me personally okay like we have a whole trading team yeah like they're, they're laser focused on well making money in all kinds of ways uh to me is my main focus over the last few days was not to blow up <laughs> <laughs> just 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 to make sure that we are fine like i know and Previous few days was fine because okay, it was very much contained in Luna. Okay, markets were going down, but it was fine. But like today, for example, I wake up, I see Tether is like losing the pack. And then you start thinking, okay, is it right? Is it wrong? Then you paint a few people you know, and I don't know, maybe they tell you, okay, it's all it's all bullshit, it's all it's all fart. And okay, you feel a bit better, but at the same time, okay, if it's actually not fart, like even if there is like one percent chance it's not fart you need to make sure it doesn't destroy your company. And so you, <laughs> I don't know, so you make sure you are flat tether or even short tether, for example. You mm-hmm. make sure that you don't hold too much on, I don't know, Asian exchanges, for example, who might blow up if tether goes through the window. And it's not really about me liking tether or not liking tether, and I actually have a pretty good relationship with Bitfinex next team. It's, it's just about surviving. And so, like, as a CEO, yeah, that, that's my main priority like in the last few days to make sure we survive and once i kind of ensured that okay then okay what what kind of exciting interesting place we can make in this environment like what do we want to close what do we want to open yeah should we check on a few protocols we're working with to, to make sure they're fine yeah those kind of things you put out like a note to to slack to the entire team uh i saw on twitter about sort of the market conditions i thought it was funny or interesting at how competitive or like, you know, you, you, you said we have competitors getting ready to invade that we cannot allow to succeed as they are antithetical to our mission. Back to work, monologue over back to work. It, it, it's funny because I feel like relative to the world you came from, crypto is is fairly like cooperative, like the all the desks kind of get along is it getting more competitive or are you just kind of trying to like uh, be be like more um, spirited here? Or is it actually getting a bit more cutthroat? I think it will be much more cutthroat with, I mean, look, there are very much cutthroat, like opportunistic firms in crypto. And like, I do recognize that we can still be friendly with them. And because like there are a lot of ways for us to cooperate, but yeah, I know who I'm dealing with. <laughs> that's, that's fine. But that being said, like you can always talk to them. And the threat fire has a very different vibe in general, like from my experience back like five, ten years ago. Like you don't talk to your competitors at all, and it's just it's just cuts through. That's it. You don't even hang out with them. Not really, because I don't know, your I don't know, your boss would tell, okay, like we never talk to those guys because maybe we'll spill out some of our secrets or mm-hmm. something. Whereas in crypto, it's like you'll hang out, but like just, you know, we're not going to talk about our algorithms. 
Exactly. Like, and to be honest, most trading firms are doing relatively the same things. Mm -hmm. So most of the alpha is not really about algorithms, but where you make most of your money. And yeah, like you should be very dumb to like spill it all out to, to your competitors. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you making a lot of your money? <laughs> <laughs> None of your competitors listen to this show, I can assure you. Yeah, there is there is this blockchain called Terra. That's that's the next next big thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about um, in terms of like the maybe the makeup of the counterparties? Are the more are the traditional counterparties freaking out a bit more than maybe the crypto native ones? Uh, nobody's freaking out. Like people just go silent. I guess. Mm. Like we haven't met anyone who was just like dumping all all they have. Because it also again, like people haven't adjusted yet. Like I think it will take people another month or two to actually adjust to the new narrative, to adjust and understand. Okay, like what do I actually want to hold? Do I want to rotate into more? I don't know simple stuff like Bitcoin or ease. Yeah, yeah. So, what do you think? What type of catalyst needs to happen, or needs to be present for some sort of resurgence? Yeah. The challenge in current environment that we, well, we have a long awaited bear market that we kind of created ourselves with all this uh, irrational exuberance, uh, with all the like crazy stuff that we created. But on top of that, yeah, there is all this outside stuff. Like there is a war going on still, like macro is quite screwed up. Like, yeah, it, it's just stuff outside, which makes it kind of better for crypto as a whole because. Like, I don't know, if it's 2018, for example, everything is down, everything is sad and gloomy, you can still quit and work, I don't know, Airbnb or Facebook mm -hmm. or like some other like exciting new startup. Now, like, there are, it's the same on the outside. Grass is not green anymore. It's like <laughs> the same gloom and doom everywhere. So you might as well stick with script, to be honest, because upside is definitely much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at some of the charts and... U.S. equities and they're almost just as scary. And you and you do realize, okay, actually, it was not only us who was crazy about valuations. It was, yeah, a lot of people outside were pretty crazy as well. With I don't know. Yeah, well, we had the we had the juice of the Fed pushing us yeah. pushing us to the to the ceiling. Yeah, and now it's going bye bye. But that that too shall pass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what are you looking forward to? What uh, you know, outside of um, maybe stuff going on internally, what is interesting you in the market right now? You know, what people are doing or building. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be quite interesting to see who survives in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like there are yeah interesting interesting dynamics that we will probably see like it would make sense to see is like there are a lot of protocols that raised a lot of money but they have i don't know either no product or shit product mm -hmm. and there are a lot of protocols that didn't manage to raise a lot of money but they actually have a product so maybe we'll see some m a for example between the two mm -hmm. because i don't know if venture firms are not that keen to deploy money and yeah it would actually make sense for some protocols to merge especially if they're doing like adjacent or hmm. same same things um and similar for us, like we would be looking because yeah, we have a like we did man manage to have a pretty good balance sheet, so we would be looking at potential M and A as well. Well, more like well, more A than M actually. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be quite interesting to see because yeah, you will see a lot of protocols drop into like total valuation of I don't know three million, five million, which can be interesting to take. Yeah, we'll definitely keep us posted on any uh, any deals that that get across the finish line. So much fun! Yep. I feel like I've seen you like so much these past few months, past few weeks. It's like every well, it's you're at everything. You go to every <laughs> single thing. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to to finish though because it's yeah, it's been a bit too much. Yeah, especially since you have like all you know, got a family and. Yep, a lot of lot of responsibilities as a, as a CEO. I guess you you you've got a good team probably that you can rely on. Uh, I have while a very good out. team. Yeah, like I mean, to be honest, like that's the main thing, especially on the trading side. Just knowing that 
people have your back, that when you will wake up, like we are not going to blow up because people actually know what they're doing. That's that helps a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you definitely. I mean, that's a. D- d- what where does that like fall in like the range of <laughs> your concern? Is it is it every day? Uh, you know, six out of ten, your concern of blowing up, or is it is it maybe like a, a you know every so often you're like, huh? Hope we don't blow up today. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's primarily when when the narratives change. Yeah, like yeah. when 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 there is a big change, big shift, and like what's going on, and okay, you start thinking, okay. What can we do different? Well, well, what should we be doing differently? But yeah, like say, thinking about yeah, what can go wrong? That's a very important part of the CEO's life. Yeah, like what? Like we are, we are not there in one year time. What will happen? Yeah, you don't want to be late. Well, this is your opportunity now to. Um, we're going to stick it to Larry, and we're going to tell the audience where they can find Wintermute on the internet, and find your logo so that the logo becomes almost more omnipresent than Larry's size and stature as a human. No, I mean, uh, I have, I have, we have like, we specially ordered a t-shirt for him. So uh, you got him. Be, did you, you got him the extra, extra He will be our large? Yeah, XX, XXT. I <laughs> <laughs> so for context, we were at a lunch with Evgeny and, and Larry was like, I don't know what your logo looks like. And uh, it was much to your chagrin. But then our entire team was able to recognize it. Not the entire team. I think it was like 65. 65? That's still pretty good. You got some. uh, Well, you want 100. I want like, yeah, 90, 95 ish. So, yeah, just get Larry the shirt and then people will be able to see it from. I want want to get to a stage where we we have our merch and just logo without. Wintermute and people like yeah that's Wintermute. Yeah, well, where can they where can they find you on online? Uh, our website, Twitter. That's primarily that. Mm-hmm. That's very very simple. Wintermute.com. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll have to have you on again during the next meltdown to see if uh, see if you make it out the other side. Sounds good. So we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting-edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more, available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at theblockcrypto.com and let them know that Frank sent you.